Okay. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Community Safety, Substance Use, and Homelessness, Promising Paths Forward, brought to you by the Systems Planning Collective. So first up, we'll have Alina Turner, Principal of Turner Strategies, CEO and co-founder of Help Seeker. Then we'll have Dale McPhee, Chief of Police with the Edmonton Police Service. We also have Susan McGee, CEO of Homeward Trust Edmonton. We have Dan Bro, Manager of Community Safety and Wellbeing with the City of Toronto. We have Martin Thompson, Manager of Community Social Development with the City of Lethbridge as our final panelist. Thank you so much, panelists, for joining us here today. And Alina, I'll let you take it away. Awesome. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. We're really excited about uh, the interest that we saw in this uh, webinar. I think we had the most um, sign up for this, over 550, I believe. So uh, that tells us a little bit about what communities are um, struggling with in, in terms of finding solutions as, and responding to um, emerging priority issues as well. So my role is to give you a little bit of context as to why um, the Systems Planning Collective started uh, this work around community safety, substance use, and homelessness. And uh, uh, Lindsay, go ahead and flip to the next slide, please. And the next one, <laughs> thanks. So um, the Systems Planning Collective, as you all know, for those of you that joined us before, exists to leverage strengths across uh, system planning organizations in Canada to look at integration across health, justice, homeless services, education, um, et cetera, linking all of these because we see common priorities and, and the need for coordinated responses uh, that are integrated from a systems perspective. So our work uh, emerges out of the homeless sector, but it is, um, of course, as all of you know, reaches so much further because um, of these interconnections. Next slide, please. So for those that are joining because of the, the homelessness angle in our work, I wanted to give a bit of context of when you listen today and, and why we chose these particular pre uh, presenters for today. Lots of us that are uh, working in the reaching home space and um, the national direction around coordinated access is something that everybody's really um, intent on uh, prioritizing as a as a key action moving forward between now and 2022. And as you all know, coordinated access is a means for us to connect people experiencing homelessness to services as quickly as possible and, and ensure uh, preventative responses are in place uh, from that homelessness perspective. But what we're finding more and more is that it doesn't make sense to only look at your homeless services. In fact, your homelessness services are really a very small percent of the resources you have in your community. They're also, homelessness is also only a small part of the issues that people that you're serving happen to experience. And so there's obviously an overlap between uh, housing stress, mental health, community safety, et cetera. So that's why it's important when we think about coordinated access that we look at it beyond our homeless programs and that we link with our partners in, in justice and health and and other systems as well. So keep that lens um, throughout the presentations to look at these linkages. Next slide, please. Okay, so again, why we want to look at this issue and why we need to look at integrated, coordinated access beyond homelessness programs. And the first piece is that from our research and mapping in 100 different communities, we see that homelessness uh, specific programs only make up 1% uh, of the resources that are actually circulating in your community to deal with these challenges. So if we look at communities like Calgary, for instance, we have $22 billion coming into this community around the social safety net, but only maybe 100 million that's specifically targeting homelessness programs. If we're only focusing on this small percentage of programs, we're going to miss you know, we're going to miss the bigger picture and we're not going to do justice to the people we're trying to serve. The other piece that we're seeing as well is if you're only focusing on housing and the immediate homelessness response, once you've rehoused somebody, these root causes still pop up if, you, if they don't become addressed. So we always say it's not housing first, it's, um, it's or sorry, it's not housing um, First, it's not just housing, it's, it's housing as well as these wraparound supports. So where do the wraparound supports come in? 
right, if we're not looking beyond our homelessness response. The other piece we see is even if we house everybody that's on various by names list, there's still inflow coming into the system as well. And the inflow is connected to these bigger pressure points in the community and, and the situation around opioid and meth um, has shifted the environment tremendously from 10 years ago when we started this work in, in ending homelessness and housing first. So how are we understanding these inflows and how are we working with our partners, especially at the systems level, to stem the inflows and, and respond, respond upstream as much as possible? Next one, please. Okay. So again, a note about systems planning and integration that the purpose of integrated coordinated access is not just to look at one part of the system to only look at homelessness and housing. We have to look at how all of the various components of the social safety net fit together and how that translates into the client's journey through um, the system from a state of instability and lack of uh, wellness and, and health to one of self-sufficiency ideally, or at least community integration and, and increased well-being. So uh, the rest of the presenters will take you through how communities are operationalizing this vision because we, you know, it's not just about the theory and the diagrams of talking about systems planning and integration, but what does this actually look like in practice and what does an integrated coordinated access model look like when it's implemented at full scale in a community. So you're going to hear from uh, folks like Dale who have led this work and are, you know, in some ways we're humbled by your presence, Dale, because you are uh, one of the um, front runners in this space and integrating justice, homelessness and, and the social response. And you're going to hear from Toronto and their response as well with, a, again, a safety focus, but as well as communities like Lethbridge that are struggling with a with a tremendous um, shifting ground in, that's manifesting in, in community safety challenges, increased homelessness and uh, lots of substance use challenges that didn't exist the way they do today. Um, so you're going to hear from Edmonton, you're going to hear from Lethbridge, you're going to hear from Toronto and the Saskatchewan experience as well, um, because they, these are communities that are taking this approach and, uh, and learning as they go in many ways. So lots of you will have additional uh, ideas and we love to hear from you in the Q&A period as well. So, um, so with that, I think that's my last slide before I hand it over to Dale. Lindsay, oh, oh, just, I guess, I, there we go. Um, core values, oh, yeah, apparently it wasn't my last slide. Core values for um, this work, and again, um, we wanted to emphasize that whatever we do, uh, at least from an SPC perspective, we focus on a rights-based approach, we focus on strength, we focus on leveraging uh, rather than duplicating, and we focus on a prevention continuum so that we can stem the flow, but also intervene um, along that prevention continuum as well. Okay. And again, if you're taking this approach on, and the important pieces that you need to have in place is visibility of the entire system of care, not just what you fund and not just homelessness. You need to understand the entire um, system that you're, that's operating in your community. You need to have that car, core operational capacity and policy to do this integrated work, including dealing with data information and sharing. Um, and of course, buy-in across the social safety net. So easier said than done, but communities that are going down this path are, are working on these key components to put in place. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, let Dale move us through um, his learnings from this work. Hey everyone, we're just actually um, going to give Dale a few moments to join us on the webinar. So we're going to switch to uh, or go to Susan McGee next. So Susan, you're up. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Everything's good. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Um, well, thanks, and thanks for including me in this and and our Edmonton community. Um, I'm going to kind of, I, I, in terms of the sequence of things, I may be a little light on the data because I know that that is something that the the chief is very big on and, and um, at the end of it, you'll catch it all, catch it all. But I, I wanted to focus a little bit just on a, just an introduction to us uh, in the next slide on our, our role. We can, we can jump ahead a couple of slides, I think, from where we are. Okay. Can you change it? Uh, there we go. Thanks. Um, 
so I know I know um, there's uh, probably a lot of repetition here for many of you that are community entities, but we also with a topic like this have have a lot of our, our partners and, and system partners that are calling in as well. So just in terms of Homeward Trust, we do occupy that space in our community as the system planner. We're a nonprofit organization that's responsible for leading the community's um, efforts to end homelessness. We have uh, that aggregator of public funding that we allocate to programs. And as we've been doing that, and we've been trusted with that role now for um, uh, our organization's been around since 99, but we, we launched our first plan uh, about 10 years ago. And so over that time, we've learned a lot, done a lot, and one of the big areas of development for us has been the um, uh, around system planning and um, changing how we count and how we measure success from the housing outcomes. We certainly still um, do all of that. There's many that we report to through our funding streams, and, and we have housed over 9,000 people um, since we started our Housing First program. But constantly, involving and that there's around coordinated access. Um, coordinated access has gone over time from a common tool that everybody used, but used independently, to a much more for sophisticated. No, just for the last time. Oh, sorry yeah. to interrupt. I'm going to just um, Dale, yeah. Dale or Heather. Uh, we can hear some of the audio. Thank you so much for joining us, first of all. But we can hear some of the audio from, from your end. So if you could mute your mic, that would be perfect. Yeah, we have ours muted. Oh, okay. Wonderful. All right. Sorry for interrupting you, Susan. Take it away. Okay. So I just, um, again, because there's a lot of, uh, range of people on the on the web webinar in terms of audiences that, that may not kind of uh, have a exposure to that coordinated access over time and many communities that are really as mandated getting that up and running and where we are right now with coordinated access is we have about 60 sites that potentially can uh, refer and assess into the coordinated access list and then on the next couple of slides we can go to the next one I, I pulled some information from what we know uh, and how we gather and maintain and analyze all that information on our by name list um, this is a, a shot from Tableau which just gives you a point in time uh, that is uh, current as of August on uh, the number of people on the list gives you an idea of what our community um, homelessness ex experiences. I, there's some surprising numbers in it probably in that uh, most of this list is chronically homeless by the definition of the federal government. All um, I would say 90% of it, but we do have about 60%. Uh, so almost two thirds of our list that would be in that chronic homeless space are also provisionally housed. So they're not in the emergency sheltered, unsheltered population that when we talk about the implications of um, uh, mental health and addictions on our community in terms of the social impact, it's often manis manifesting in um, the unsheltered, the interactions with the unsheltered population and emergency shelters. So it's really um, for us important to kind of be keeping a clear perspective because um, what I can say, and if you want to go to the next list, uh, next slide, um, that we do have amongst those, uh, our entire list still, um, over 50% uh, present with significant physical, mental health, and substance uh, use barriers. Now, this is self-reported, and the, some of the really great work that has happened in communities across Canada is that as we've been doing this work, we've been learning a lot about um, the work that needs to be done to really verify and have proper assessments done beyond the prioritization tools that we use to access housing. So this is just a bit of a profile of what we're talking about amongst that population. Um, over half of them presenting with uh, barriers that are all of the above, mental, physical, substance abuse. Um, on the next slide, a bit of another surprising information piece for us is that even amongst the provisionally housed, um, there, there's a lot of common, this is a kind of a screenshot of median acuity and across all of those populations, um, it is uh, consistently, fairly consistent, which um, compared to some of the data we might look at south of the border, um, we've been looking at some of the HUD numbers and they, they typically will see a much lower um, indication around the provisionally accommodated. This is just all information that we constantly dig into and helps inform our decisions. But most importantly for this call, um, it reflects the fact that um, even though we might, we have a smaller subset of our population that is living on the streets um, or living rough across all of those experiencing homelessness, the prevalence of that acuity the mental health and the addictions um, is uh, extended beyond that population and, and, and therefore our system has to really be able to support 
a comprehensive um, approach and not just for that proper population. Um, what are we doing about that? So on the next slide, um, I mentioned, again, some of the things that the data says that are um, a little bit surprising. I would also say beyond that, and we really, we use our by name list. We do the count every couple of years, as many communities do. And we also kind of constellate with other pieces of information. We've had um, outreach teams and in targeted efforts do one-on-one -on -one interviews with those um, experiencing homelessness. And some of those initiatives have been really specific about how we need to move them from uh, in, into, uh, if, if we can, engage them in any other system, shelter, temporary housing, bridge housing, in order to start working on permanent supportive housing solutions. What are those barriers? So we've, we've actively been engaging and gathering more, more personal information about that through one-on-one -on -one interviews with a smaller population. And we do know also from the intensive case management team specifically, so at any given time, we, we may have uh, 900 to 1,000 people on our intensive case management uh, caseload that is supported by about a dozen teams in our community. Uh, but 30% of them present with uh, more complex needs. And on the by name list, currently there's 145 individuals on the, on the by name list that are in a referral process to get higher levels of support, like permanent supportive housing or our ACT, which we call our clinical high intensity services. And over half of those are trimorbid. So I, when we look at that population, that's kind of where we're at, gives you an idea of, of the scale of what we're working with in our community. And on the next slide, um, I, I just want to mention, and I know it will, it is really the focus here is what we've seen in terms of shifts. And this is information um, from our work with Alberta Health Services around how meth has impacted our community and the, the challenges we have with that particular um, concern. And we, you know, I think all have a shared experience that, that some of these drugs these, the, and the changes that we've seen in drug use in our communities have a very different impact on safety for workers and our ability to uh, engage and have uh, realized success in, in the interventions that we have historically relied on and have built our built really the strengths of our programs around. And we're seeing um, increases, the people presenting in the health system with meth has tripled between 2015 and 2019, and it is second to alcohol in major AHF treatment centers. Sorry, I, I, I can hear something and it got me rattled. <laughs> it took me off my game, sorry about that. Um, so just a quick wrap up on that. And these are all, um, I think, this is all information that other colleagues on the on the web webinar will have much more detail on, but you know it has resulted in increases in in deaths in our community, and it's the biggest impact on the justice system. So, what are, so are we what are doing, doing locally? Um, the next slide speaks a little bit to some of our current adaptations. Things were we're working on, um, we have a huge priority amongst um, our program investment permanent supportive housing can be built, built, built well and um, specifically for the high needs population that we don't undershoot the development of those units and who they need to support. So there's lots of work going on there and it's been very, um, I think very positive and, and what I really want to acknowledge is that the city of Edmonton has been a significant player in committing resources for one, 140 million for affordable housing in our community, prior, prioritizing 900 units of supportive housing. But, but beyond that, also just um, it really intentionally maintaining a focus on this product and the importance of it to, need the, to meet the needs of our most vulnerable. And, and, and that leadership has been really critical as we've gone forward and kind of look for locations and look for places where we can realize those numbers. Um, the current PSH models that we have, um, you know, some of, we are reviewing all of them. I mean, most communities, um, are on a regular basis reviewing the, the, the programs that they have and making sure that the program models reflect need. And in our case, it's a very fulsome review right now. Um, models uh, can evolve over time. Uh, we also have opportunities and we've seen some really fantastic partnerships with a, uh, our projects and providing more formalized relationships for in reach with, for certain services. And we want to be able to really um, leverage those experiences and uh, the outcomes, that, the really positive outcomes that they've had and ensure that that is the, the ground that we're building off all of the rest of our PSH. And so there's lots of work going on there. We, we have um, had some opportunities to try to look at how we might in-reach some of um, our 
staff are uh, and our services provided by others in the community under the Housing First program to connect more really uh, with Edmonton Police Service. Edmonton Police Service has uh, led the HEWAS program, which is a heavy user service program, which is um, a, a very specific effort but also by making housing and access staff directly available and connected to EPS in, in a prototype. There's a, it's a, it is a prototype, there's gonna be lots of learning, but that's one of the ways that we're in reaching into a system. Um, we are also similarly looking at how we work with the inner city health and wellness program at the Royal Alex, which is our um, downtown uh, uh, hospital and their emergency program is ARCH, the ARCH clinic. And um, it's, uh, really exciting to be in a relationship in a role where we can quickly act with that, that group and insert some resources that are about transitioning people um, that would otherwise be in the hospital or leaving the hospital because they just have no other options and voluntarily leaving and being very vulnerable and ending up um, on the streets. So those are some of the things that we are kind of working on at a program level. Um, this is so some, you know, because of where we're at and the amount of engagement that we've We've had around system planning with um, over over years and um, with the relationships we have. We're working also very directly with um, Alberta Health Services in, in kind of a, a much more um, system planning uh, effort. This is a shared reality for them. Some of the information that I have here is more specific to what their experience of this population is from a service lens within hospital and acute care. So. 20 to 40 percent of uh, acute care beds, uh, most of them at Alberta Hospital, are all um, occupied by alternate care levels, i.e. they could be elsewhere, but there's nowhere for them to go. They don't need the level of care in the hospital environment that they're in. I know I'm oversimplifying that for the clinicians on the phone, sorry about that, <laughs> but, but just to give you an idea of what that means to the system, that's a lot of beds that are occupied that other people can't access for one. So it's a bottleneck for sure. It's far more resource intensive than the alternative and appropriate housing that can be provided with the right supports in community. And um, it's, it's not getting any better. So when we see those contributions of the increase, for instance, in meth use and uh, without some really proactive effort around changing the way that we work together, we're, we're not gonna see any improvements in that regard. And there's been a really high level of commitment to work on that. So um, there's part of that shared challenge. Some of the next steps that we'll be taking include um, working on a, building relationships with the rest of these systems. And I, I, these are all things that we all work on all the time. So I don't want to kind of uh, oversimplify it. What I'm trying to relay though is that this is in, evolved in our discussions with, uh, with our, our team, our senior team at Alberta, um, well, the, the Alberta Health Services and Mental Health and Addictions and Homer Trust really committing to working through this to the end. So this is a very different kind of level of commitment in sharing information, uh, but also just really identifying within these other systems who they need to be connecting with. And, and there is an integrated health, uh, housing and health services action plan that uh, with Alberta Health, but it, it's, it's siloed and isn't linked to our description of our continuums and our services in community and this team that is working on this is committed to amalgamating and working through that and creating um, pathways of care that reflect the needs in the community. Um, the analysis that we do all the time is we know that this work ultimately also if it's there's cost savings I think cost avoidance however you want to describe it but we often have a real challenge at the community end on quantifying that because we don't always have the administrative data that would allow us to do that well. So the, this team, um, by working together and with those other systems, is focused on identifying those, those, those gaps so that the administrative data can better inform what we're actually um, looking at in terms of cost avoidance. And it's a long list. Um, I'm not going to go through it all because I think that I think in general, um, these are things that most communities know, and if they haven't operationalized or in some form trying to, we've been, we've, I mean, that's, that was very initial premise of most plans years ago. What needs to happen in community to get to a point where you can really see the leveraging opportunity and the buy-in um, that has created an environment. And I, and I would just speak to that a little bit in terms of um, why now. So I believe that uh, some of this may seem, seem obvious, but we really need to be in a place where we have demonstrated some of the successes that we have have seen in Edmonton. Um, there is a kind of a hope orientation to knowing 
that we actually can support people differently and with different outcomes for success because we have done we have housed individuals with complex needs and they are um, we are we we have the basis to engage those systems in a very confident way and I think that that has been really helpful for us I know it's it's perhaps uh, for those that have worked in lots of different communities, maybe it doesn't seem as necessary, but I think that's been my experience of the journey that I've been on with this, or with this organization has worked for the last 15 years, is that the buy-in um, is significant and the motivation of uh, others and people within systems changes over time because they see the evidence and they are able to kind of see the possibilities. So that's uh, a little bit of a read on where we're at. Um, this is all, I think, um, really really exciting in terms of the um the opportunities that we uh, that we are experiencing in in this engagement it doesn't come without some on my next slide um some additional i'm sorry um you can jump ahead i jumped too many i, I talked too fast i forgot to tell you to change your slide and i was reading my notes <laughs> thanks go to the final thoughts on the end Thanks. I'm sorry about that, guys. Um, I, I wanted, in kind of preparing for this, one of the things that uh, occurs to me and what I am somewhat concerned about is that um, we we have to work on these large systems and this long game work, and we also need to continue to de demonstrate results. And we can be pulled as communities, and as Elena was alluding to, the resources in our communities are a very small part of the bigger the bigger um, system of care. And it can be left up to us to kind of figure that out. And that um, kind of as we get pulled into really long game system changing conversations, it can it can um, reduce our ability to perform and then deliver the results that got us into the conversation in the first place. So we just really need to balance that. We need to use all the tools in our toolbox. Um, we have an incredible amount of data. I don't think that we work hard enough. And I don't think that we uh, necessarily collectively are able to for um, uh, the kind of predictive work that is possible. And we can only do that, though, with more data. So you need a lot of data to be able to do that, which includes administrative data. So that's a potential I see in this work together. And um, I will say that I guess probably one of my, my greatest concerns for communities is that um, is that this is really the housing work that has occurred and the success that has been realized is, is very intensive work and it does take a long time. And there has to be a yes and to also shifting to ensure that we're um, developing and directionally in a way that we can do better system planning and a, and a more comprehensive uh, effort as well as continue to do that housing work because we can get spread really thin quickly um, and um, maintaining a, a focus on that housing work. It's a little bit like, you know, just, you know, going after the next crisis and then the capacity that we've built can be eroded if it isn't continually supported. So it's just kind of a cautionary note in terms of maintaining um, just the, the yes and in our shifts and our engagement in, in the system planning and really kind of focusing on certain populations while we still need to continue to do the, the rest of the work. And that's it. Excellent. Thanks so much, Susan. You're a superstar for jumping in and, and for riding out some of the tech glitches. And audience, you as well. Thank you for bearing with us. Alrighty, Dale, are you on the line? Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. There's a little bit of feedback happening. Okay, so we're having all kinds of difficulty here this morning uh, with our firewall, unfortunately. So I'm going to try this, and hopefully we we get through it. I understand we uh, need to move a little bit quick here, so I'll try to skip things that I think have been covered or or I want to thank uh, Dr. Turner, obviously, and Susan, and I also want to thank Susan for her uh, partnership in Edmonton. I'll get you to change the, the first slide. Um, so I change one more. And so that's a little bit of background of who, what I've been and some of the experiences I've been fortunate enough to have. Uh, it's really not relevant other than I want to say that what I'm going to... I'll take that away. Yeah, so it's not relevant in the fact that, uh, uh, sorry about this background noise, but uh, these are just the experiences that I've been fortunate to hold in the last several years working within this space. And I think they all uh, offer a different perspective in relation to how we look at this. So, uh, change slides. 
And I can't see the screen, so I'm just going to assume that the slides are being changed. Um, in relation to the next one, I think what we're really talking about here, economics, and economics are about supply and demand. And the picture on the screen is we've been 100% focused on supply, and I'm not so sure that we haven't or targeted our attention on how we reduce demand. <clears throat> that is a picture of a garden hose. I'm an only child. My father passed away four years ago. I use this example when I speak. <clears throat> picture all my mom's valuables in the backyard the garden hose is stuck wide open what does she do uh, when it uh, her valuables are at risk call her only son I run over there I start drinking the water of the fire hose long story short I get wore out I call a, a friend of mine over uh, three days times later we're all laying on the deck a bunch of old people and the reality is is uh, a bright university student comes by and tells us to turn down the tap we need some problem solvers in this environment to start turning down the taps as much as we need more supply. Uh, turn slide. What we've seen uh, now indeed. in relation yeah. to this is we slide change. Dan, I'm sorry to interrupt. Would you mm, be not uh, done anything other than think money is going to solve this problem to a certain degree? And I'm going to talk about that's not really the response. Change slides. Um, we were fortunate back about eight, nine years ago, we took a team over to Scotland. Uh, we actually looked at two parts of the world that were actually doing some good work in this uh, partnership space. One was in Africa and the other was in Scotland. Think about uh, trying to get people to support a trip to Africa from a, from a municipal government. It wasn't going to happen. We went to Scotland and we looked at some of the things that we're doing and then we came back and we built a model around that. Uh, that we thought could start to introduce ourselves about how we put the right partnerships in the table to deal with complex problems. Change slides. <clears throat> this was exactly what we were dealing with. So if you look at all the things we're talking about, these were two environments, high unemployment, suicide rate, you can read the chart here, housing problems, education, standard drug use. In really Scotland, white homogeneous society, uh, Prince Albert, obviously a uh, high First Nations society. What we learned is, is we were dealing with risk factors and their uh, basically how they react or, or relate to each other. And if we're really going to design, design a solution, we got to start putting the people at the middle of the solution and not tackle it by problem. Change slides. I bring that into the environment that we live in now, and there's three slides there. These all uh, are areas that I've been fortunate to lead in the course of my career. The municipal call in the bottom left, 75% antisocial behavior, 25-5, uh, which the 5% is contained in the 25. That's the Prince Albert Police Service, 75% of the work were antisocial behavior, uh, and only 5% of the work was leading to criminal charges. That was the provincial one on the right of that in Saskatchewan, 81% antisocial behavior, 19%, and then 5% criminal charges. You can see that criminal charges is almost consistent, and it's pretty consistent across the country. And then you look at the Edmonton Police Service on the top, 92.7% of our calls for service are priority fours and fives, or a lot of the things that Susan was mentioning, and we become that responding agency from a justice perspective and it makes you think are we really using the right tool or are we using the right technique to get maximum results based on first contact switch slides what we really started to do was reverse engineer this and we started this many years ago from many different angles and i'll get you to switch slides it started with our trip at switch slides again when we went to scotland we looked at the continuum of joe switch slides and we looked at joe through a lens of health, social services, education, justice, and from a policy perspective. But as you can see, these are a whole bunch of things that Joe went through at a, at a young age. Joe obviously has changed the name, but these are real from our, from our uh, uh, basically putting information together. Uh, alcohol, domestic violence, Joe moved to a foster home, carry on, next slide. Um, just going to do some highlights. He was, witnessed his mom stab his father to death. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, never did get follow-up and treatment uh, in relation to this uh, change slide. Grandma had uh, uh, canceled it, uh, the appointment a few times based on transportation. So this young fella never did get the service in first instance. And it was a large part because we just didn't talk to each other. For whatever reasons, 
you know, privacy barriers or whatever excuse. Uh, and I, I say this literally because I was one of those people of reasons for not doing this and, and put safety and well-being of an individual and a family at the center. We missed the whole pile of opportunities. And this kid never got the mental health treatment. He did switch sides. And it just spiraled. I mean, trial for sexual assault, the sister refused to testify. Obviously, we're dealing with a family situation, changed slides. Mom Mary's, uh, 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 was released from parole, married a murder in prison. Kids moved back with mom, changed slides. Joe missed a school anger management problem. What we basically found is you look at YO involved. The kid's now 12. Uh, switch slides. Then we went to the police perspective, and the police are pretty good in release of their data. What the police aren't real good at is using their data to work with their partners to figure out a different response. In essence, we tend to own too many of these things, and probably we need to lead a lot of these things, but we need our partners uh, and all of us going in the same direction. But change slides. This guy had a litany in relation to the charges and the interactions that we had with police, escape custody, all police officer, obstruct public police, and it, it just goes on and on until it got to the next slide. This young individual, next slide, uh, 16 years old, took a 14 year old's life. Whoops, sorry, go back one. Uh, but that wasn't the crux of this. The crux of this was, and we missed 40 intervention opportunities to change the path of this young person's life just because we weren't using our data on a collective response, we were using our data as a siloed response, and it's like taking a piece of paper, poking holes in it, and really what we were seeing is pieces of the individual change slides. It even got more uh, 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 when we actually started to look at this change one uh, more slide. We actually looked at this from a community's perspective, and that greenhouse was where this young kid grew up. Those red dots were people in the community living with multiple criminal code convictions. We had to go multiple because when we went individual, it was just a red blur and you couldn't see the greenhouse. Now, you got to see some humor in that because at the end of the day, it just isn't the humor in relation to um, what could be done. It's, wow, how could we miss this? How could we miss this? But long story short, change slides. We could have put the services right in that community and as you see at the bottom we missed 40 intervention opportunities to change the path and it was blatantly honest or blatantly as a result that we were focused on collaborating and not true partnership and i'm going to get that in a minute but we weren't putting the individual uh, at the center of this and say how can we make a difference matter of fact think of the multiple deaths in quest in this country i think all but Pretty much all that I've read has told us we had to share information better, and yet we still haven't done it to a certain degree. Change slides. So we tried a different approach. We brought the hub in Scotland. Basically, the hub is designed uh, to basically get interagencies working together at the same time. Uh, then we talked about how do we, from a, a regional uh, data center from StatsCan, how do we make sure our data ends up in good policy? Now, hubs were designed to connect the services. That's what they were. So here's an example. 14-year-old girl, teacher brings it to the table. She's having trouble in class. She's went from an A student to failing. Long story short, uh, we, uh, the teacher's uh, concerned. There's drugs in the home. Uh, we make a call and we go and uh, meet with the kid. She doesn't want uh, the, the teacher there because of embarrassment, but long story short, uh, when social services looked at their records, they were at the house 13 times in the last four minutes or four months. Uh, housing had been there numerous times. Long story short, uh, they go and meet the kid. The, the day that she was found, and which I haven't mentioned, face down drunk in a snowbank, call from a member of the public. They found out mom is involved in a domestic violence relationship for the last six months, falling off the grid, family spiraling, all those things in re relation to what's going on. Police can deal with the individual who are already had done three years for a similar type incident. Um, housing comes in, changes the locks on the door. Social services does an emergency intervention order, gets the family and the services. A long story short, the mom was taking upgrading at one of our local colleges, reconnects the dots. The family isn't back in the system for four years. Now, that goes back to individual agencies to do their job. But the start of it was a team approach to connect it and say that this family is a priority that we need to reduce the demand or the need 
to continually to be involved in each and every day. So switch slides. So at this hub table, we start to look at data. And as you can see, originating, and aging, originating agencies were largely driven by the police and education, but the lead agencies leaving with this was a drastic change. Now the difference between this, who brought it in was individuals, and it left in a team environment to actually have a different approach to do it. And then each other held each other accountable for their own work within their ministry. It wasn't that the hub was designed to be the measurement tool. Hub was designed to be that connector to making sure that everybody's aware of what's going on. Next slide. As you can see, the hub uh, from 2012 to 2018, check out in 2018, antisocial, problematic behavior, substance abuse issues, mental health, family circumstances, victimization. You can see housing on there. At the end of the day, there's 145 of these in Canada and in the U.S., and these top ones seem to be always the same. Now, that said, how many of those can police call? Not very many, but how many of those can police lead the catalyst in the community and bringing the partners together? Pretty much all of them, because they're generally, a lot of times, the only 24-7 door-to-door service, us and EMS, that are taking that first instance. So how do we make that first contact meaningful? Switch slides. There's been a ton of data in relation to study in the hub model, and there needs to be a ton more, make no mistake about that. But I think if you think it from a franchise concept, if the 145th or the 132nd isn't working properly, it's probably because the leader of that franchise or the leadership hasn't totally bought in and it becomes more of a problematic due to that behavior than the principles of working together in a combined environment is. But again, not to say this is the ultimate answer. Switch slides. I wanna highlight on what Susan said. I was fortunate about eight months ago to speak on Bay Street uh, in Toronto. Might've been a little longer than that. Billy Bean, for those people of you who have seen Moneyball, general manager of Oakland Athletics, that was his line that helped me change my thoughts. Before we brought analytics to baseball, we paid for a whole lot of things that had no impact on the game. I would strenuously argue after being six and a half uh, years in a deputy minister, this is one of our biggest problems. It's not that the money isn't in the system, it's that the mutual goals and the opportunities, we haven't leveraged what true partnerships are to get the results. And I'll give you an example of that switch slide. This is uh, an individual family, and this is again right out of the files. Um, this is basically Nana. Nana is a 56-year-old female. Uh, uh, she's from Regina, Saskatchewan. She has 19 grandchildren, two great-grandchildren. At the end of the day, um, we look at Nana um, and we look at her from a lens. Uh, 32 years, all this family's ever received is a social assistance check. We know what the issues are, depression, addictions, housing, and the list goes on. Uh, the heavy alcohol, sexual abuse, domestic violence, neglect, gang activity, all these things are interconnected. But if we try to deal with this family in one particular individual lens, we're not going to be successful. What we did was put a navigator in the system to start saying, can we reduce the demand? Can we make all the agencies understand the whole equation? <clears throat> Flip slide. That family was costing us five to seven million dollars a year with a projection in the next life cycle, eight to 12 years, that it's going to uh, be 17 to 19 million dollars across the system. And when we were studying this, <coughs> the province, we had 2,500 of them. They spend at 23 times the rate. You can see the stuff on the right-hand side, a third of children involved child family programs have gone on to income assistance and 450 million or 49% of resources are spent on the top 5% of 1,700 children. To me, that's not a problem, that's an opportunity. <clears throat> but the only way it's an opportunity is if we collectively have the right people at the table, a consortium of the willing look at it. Let me give you another example, switch sides. <coughs> I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Up in the Air, George Clooney, but Tom Stuker is the uh, most frequent flyer of United Airlines. He's flown 10 million miles, he's a self-proclaimed legend, flew a million miles uh, in one year. And when you look at Tom Stuker, uh, his favorite snack was chips and guac. We looked at corrections with our frequent flyer that basically never served more than a sentence of six months at any one given time. Most of them are really minor offenses. 
and figured out how much chips and guac it was counting, costing us in corrections, switch sides. But then we actually looked at when were we successful at keeping Tom out of jail? Now, we all know uh, that there's some things that correlate with this. Some would say it's a relationship, but in this particular instance, the only two times that he really stayed out in the, those particular things, what did he have? Well, he had a job, but at the end of the day, he had some stability with that job, he had housing. And it, but when he fell off the rails in relation to going back to the addiction piece, we didn't pick up the pieces to get him back on the track. We put him back in the jail and he just continued to go backwards. So switch slides. As you can see, when you look at it from a corrections lens, you know, a small percentage of the people, uh, when we look at contacts and involvements within the justice system, you know, the 10 to 50 times are a lot of things. These are our chronic folks, for the most part, are entrenched in the system and mental health and addictions, domestic violence, trauma. We know the story, but we've looked at them from siloed approach and we haven't looked at them from a collective approach. And I'll give you an example, switch slide. <coughs> this is a particular thing where we looked at grade one school absenteeism and police calls for service in one city. Now, what we found is there was a huge correlation between school absenteeism and criminal code calls for service, or no, sorry, police calls for service, not criminal code. Now, obviously the grade one-er isn't out committing crime, but the family and the disruption on the grade one-er is where the cycle starts. And when we had thousands of people that were, you know, enroll in one school and nobody knows where they are by the end of the year, and you can see how we've missed an opportunity not to go in the old days and pull the kid by the year and bring him back to class because we all know that works but what an opportunity to figure out what's going on and how you can help that family switch slides here's something that we have in edmonton and a lot of police services have it and this is a partnership between police and public health called pack teams police and crisis teams this is one city that we looked at in relation to those heat maps, two of those areas where hospitals are, they should be. The third area is where mental health workers were scared to go into. What do we do? We put police and mental health workers in a police call, a car, and we actually go into those areas. Switch slides. And what do you see as immediate results? 248 ED diversions, average of 10 a month, uh, 53 arrest diversions, an average of two a month. Switch slides. And over time, it compacts into a lot of money and better outcomes from people. But the only way to do that is to put and measure it from a collective perspective and not a siloed perspective, because then you don't get the full costing or the full benefit. Switch slides. And then you add analytics and we built a system that we're now looking at the Edmonton Police Service and done is through technology, how do we connect in the field to the emergency rooms and the hospital so we're better uh, or to uh, uh, an early assessment in the field that we can make the right decision on first impact or contact and how can we make changes. Technology needs to play a big role. It's a huge opportunity and this is actually showing us some of the potential opportunities that we have going forward. Uh, switch slides. I'm going quickly because I know uh, we got to make up some time and uh, certainly we can have some questions. Here's an interesting study. This is a study that a doctor that now works for us did in another, uh, uh, in his previous job. Uh, what is the impact on child apprehension and social housing? As you can see, in the low risk, high risk, and moderate, very little. But in the high risk, very high risk, it's huge. But just so happened that we had most of our social housing units in the wrong areas to get benefit and impact. So again, opportunity. It's not a cookie cutter approach, as Susan said, it's almost an adaptive approach where we know what the good things are that we need to protect. I used to own a and I always said, you need to protect the teen burger, the root beer, and the onion rings, but everything else you need to have a look at. Here's the point where we have the principles of success, but we need to make sure that we're putting our resources, which come in the forms of money and people in the right area. Switch slide. To me, this is the breakthrough. I'm not sure if anybody has went to these conferences. I was fortunate to speak several years ago, changed my thinking in Amsterdam. It was in Toronto. 
Uh, next one is in Edinburgh. I, I've spoken at three of them. Uh, law enforcement, public health. Are the social determinants of health not the same as the social determinants of justice? Well, of course they are. You know, if you took public health and you minus acute care and you took community safety and you minus enforcement, would they not be the same thing? And I don't mean exactly the same, but the reality is that's both ends of the spectrum. And what you see there is everything in the middle is generally a product of one end of the system. And we've never looked at it from a systems approach. Switch slide. I'll give you a couple examples of things that we tried differently. People might remember uh, the, the shooting in North Battleford, Saskatchewan years ago, uh, or a couple, or I guess it's just a little over a year and a half ago. I was the deputy that went into there. There's two issues there. There's the race system issue that everybody's saying was prominent, and there's an issue that co constituted the contact which is property crime in rural Saskatchewan. We could have looked at that the same way. Part of the first issue of the racism, the systemic, because that's a belief system that we're continuing as a society to work through. And my kids obviously have less of a problem than I do in relation to a generation. And, and I'm not saying me, but I'm saying the age ga the gap. But in the face-to-face -face contact, rather than make laws, tougher laws, we decided to go to the tech community and, and we had 13 submissions, $25,000 prize with Innovation Saskatchewan, and a beekeeper came together with a hardware engineer, and they designed a device for less than 50 bucks that could put anything of value. Your tractor, your truck, uh, uh, could be your welder, could be anything. If it moved, it sent you a text, and if it wasn't you, you activate GPS and you send it in real time. So now the need for face-to-face -face contact on property crime isn't quite as great. Now, how can we look at that through multiple lenses, I think, is really our opportunity. Switch slides. And I could go on on that one for a while because we've done several. But really, this is a decision between efficient and effective. Efficient means play the game better. Effective means change the way we play the game or change the system. Honestly, I think if we're trying to design a program to be quicker, it isn't going to work. Time to look at our system. And we've had lots of thoughts in relation to how we can do that. But switch slides. Really, everybody here has probably played the game of risk. And everybody knows that if you put an army on every country, what are you? You're first out of the game. Well, that's what we have right now. And unfortunately, we're not calling a spade a shovel on that. But we have all of our armies for good going in a multitude of directions. And I'm not so sure that we've leveraged or capitalized on the opportunity to put our armies for good to fight from a strength or a perspective of where the most of our work is driven and where most of the evidence leads that we can have uh, uh, some positive impact. Switch slides. From, from what we have learned, uh, uh, click again, is this is a, oh no, sorry, go back one. There should be four clicks on this. Anyways, you can't see it, but this is a gasoline engine. Uh, think of research as the gas. If we don't have research, we don't have the ability to do it. Think of practice as the practitioners. Uh, that's your oil. If you don't have that oil, it's not going to work. Think of alignment as each of those pistons. And if those alignment are the ministries of health, social services, or it's, it's somebody in housing, or it's the police, or whoever it is, what happens if those uh, pistons aren't in alignment? That engine doesn't go very far. Our focus needs to be on the alignment part of this engine to get to the outcomes. Because I think if we drive the other two together, we'll get the third. Switch slides. Data would tell you there's only two things that matter in this uh, particular area. It's the intake and the off-ramps, reducing the intake into the system and making sure every off-ramp works. How do we slow down intake at the same time and making sure an off-ramp works? What is an off-ramp? Income assistance, child welfare, bail remand, housing, mental health, addictions, the list goes on. What we traditionally measure is what we put on the highway, and nobody's actually measuring what we get off the highway into that state of independence. And I think once we change that metric, we make some pretty good gains. Uh, switch slides quickly. And really, we have the ability to do that now. We just need the consortium of the willing to drive the change. In relation to this, what we've been focused on and the EPS is focused on, we need an ecosystem for change. If you look at the bottom left-hand side, those are the things that are driving the majority of our work on the social aspect. Now, don't confuse this with organized crime, that criminal behavior, a gang. That isn't what we're talking about. This isn't, that's a separate presentation. A lot of these things can become that, but really 
you need data in the center, you need a lab for integrated social practice, you know, that you can bring public, private, philanthropy together, somebody to be that intermediary in the middle, and you need separate money to making sure that we're measuring and we're doing things together rather than competing for dollars. Change slides. So with that said, I think we can make the statement status quo is not acceptable or nor is it sustainable. And the reality is I think it's to the leadership and a lot of people on the line that have taken the time out of their busy schedule to start, start looking at this. But I don't think that we've quite got this right. I think we got pockets of expertise, but I think we built this house in 1975 with the aluminum wire and we need to take the wire and rewire this stuff together. And I actually think police need to play a role as an electrician, not as an owner, to actually start to bring our community uh, groups together because we're one of the local voices. Most others are provincial or federal. Uh, and I think that we're sitting on a real opportunity to change this business. And I think in the economic times that we're in, this is the perfect environment to drive change. It's hard work. It needs all hands on deck, but I look forward to working with you. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Hopefully, I didn't go too fast. I think, uh, uh, Lindsay, I, I got what she has said as a request. I have 25 minutes exactly, but certainly I'll leave it at that. And thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chief Dale McBee, for joining us. And we're going to switch things off to Dan Bro. And again, just bear with me a second. I'm going to switch the slides to Dan's section. I'll use this time uh, just to say that I'm a proud Albertan. I was born in Medicine Hat, lived in Canmore and Banff, settled in Calgary and did my education there at Mount Royal College and started my career at the Mustard Seed. Alberta Safe House, uh, and then I moved to Toronto to have a son. My, I have a family that lives in Calgary and Edmonton, and I miss home. So <laughs> just think for the Albertans out there. Excellent, Dan, and we're ready to go whenever you're ready. Great. Uh, so um, first slide. Uh, so we're a very small team of 14 people. We include uh, one manager, one support assistant, one supervisor. Uh, there are 10 community development officers and one policy and research consultant. We work in the areas of prevention, intervention, preparation, we try to build capacities and innovate systems. Next slide, please. Uh, in CCRP, Community Crisis Response Program, uh, uh, was created in 2008 as the city's response to gun violence. It expanded in 2011. Uh, we visited our uh, colleague Dale McPhee out in Prince Albert in 2012 and um, we birthed Focus which was a hub model that uh, Dale walked us through. In 2013 we uh, launched another um, uh, situation table called Spider in 2014, expanded Focus in 2016 and Community Crisis Response expanded in 2018. We had already aligned our data to capture risk at a neighborhood level, uh, identifying through data data system change innovations and reform uh, opportunities. Uh, in 2018, the community safety and well-being plans were downloaded to municipalities and we're well positioned to leverage our existing networks uh, um, uh, in order to create the community safety and well-being plan. Um, and through our works unit, you know, frontline staff um, that are working at our partner agencies um, and are working with our community development officers are uh, creating data sets uh, that will then provide evidence to champion systemic issues that require innovation and reform. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, program overviews here, community crisis response is a citywide only response to violence, uh, shooting, stabbing, swarmings, um, homicides, gun violence, uh, in, even raids. Um, uh, we've uh, the staff create networks, uh, local safety plans and protocols. There are 27 networks across the city and that number continues to grow. Um, once the networks are secure, we um, uh, transition those networks directly into the community, uh, create communication plans to enact, enact uh, you know, a network and active protocols and safety protocols that have been might, that might have been created within the network. Um, so then it becomes a partnership with a group of uh, residents, service providers. These networks are made up of sometimes uh, the local councillor as well. 
uh, but often involve the Toronto police, police social housing, uh, and uh, and uh, 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 concerned residents. Um, for incidents, uh, we uh, also promote recovery and healing. Um, you know, one uh, some of the mental health data that we've been able to produce across our unit um, shows that mental health and um, crime and victimization are um, are often mentioned uh, in the same sentence and are often uh, top risk factors identified together. Um, so we created a mental health uh, community development officer position. Uh, their job is to work across the entire city. Um, we, it, was a, it was a pilot to work across the city to provide more mental health supports to victims of violence communities that might have been impacted by violence and provide uh, support uh, to resident groups um, uh, that, uh, uh, to discuss trauma and provide trauma training and workshops and capacity building. Um, we've decided that this pilot is going into prototype, so we're in the uh, process of creating a job description for what that particular community development officer is going to work on. And in 2018, uh, community crisis response responded to 664 incidents in the year. In 2019, we are projecting that we'll be responding to over 725. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, SPIDER is an uh, excellent acronym, so the Specialized Program for Interdivisional Enhanced Responsiveness to Vulnerability. This is, we work for the city, so we love our acronyms. Um, but it is also a hub model situation table uh, where the, uh, complex elevated health and safety risks to people, property, and neighbors uh, are identified. These are very vulnerable clients. Uh, we define vulnerability as uh, a gap in services between what uh, somebody might need and what services may or may not be available uh, to them. Um, and we also on that have, uh, have standardized definitions of uh, vulnerability across our corporation, which was large along with our partners so that everybody knew what we were talking about when we were talking about vulnerability because at the time there wasn't standardization. We've also led a lot of getting to yes work um, is what we call it. And so, you know, realizing that, you know, a vulnerable person should only reach so far or not as far as um, they choose to reach. Uh, it's up to service providers who have capacity to change um, in order and, and uh, evolve and innovate in order to better serve um, vulnerability uh, and or reduce vulnerability and close gaps. Um, it's up to us to be able to change what we're doing and figure out how we can do things differently as opposed to, um, uh, you know, traditional service provision methods um, that have proved uh, uh, to, to be uh, uh, impossible for a vulnerable person to accept. And then we blame that on service refusal when it's really our fault for not being creative. Um, uh, we do have open dialogues. We hold 10 a year between 250 and 300 um, uh, people usually attend. These are service providers across the city. Um, we provide best practice uh, uh, training at, at joint door knocks, um, uh, you know, and, and how to do one. Uh, and then uh, the uh, spider also helps inform uh, uh, things on, sorry, housing and homelessness remains to be the, uh, the top risk factors that um, uh, spider addresses precarious homelessness, not appropriate housing, um, hospital discharged, unlicensed rooming homes, bed bugs and service provision, expertise and consultation um, related to supervised injection sites, discarded needles, and rising prevalence of meth, um, uh, uh, where uh, we're seeing high and risky behavior, uh, including assaults. And so, um, the uh, spider team is there for extreme vulnerability um, and tries to uh, uh, champion uh, system issues. Uh, next slide, please. And Focus was the first hub model that we were able to introduce at Toronto. Focus Toronto is led by United Way, Greater Toronto, Toronto Police, uh, and the City of Toronto. And we're uh, supporting. Uh, we're supported by our province, uh, who holds all of our data. Um, we have uh, agreed on the risk factors and uh, our process, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, but uh, as a province, um, we're now all feeding a, a very large database um, so that we can then, uh, you know, have our have our data, compare it, and draw reports from it. Uh, take a look at local trends as well as trends um, uh, as well as regional and provincial trends. Um, looking at we're looking at situations of. Uh, uh, elevated risk to crime and victimization at focus is uh, the departure from sp uh, the difference between spider and focus um, is, uh, is that these are specific to crime and victimization. There are four tables that are set up aligned with police division, the Northwest table, downtown East, downtown West and North Scarborough table. Um, downtown East table aligns 
uh, with a larger downtown east strategy due to the risk factors of homelessness, housing, mental health, drugs, including overdose death, placement of supervised injection sites, uh, and how they are uh, close to uh, respite shelters and warming centers. And there's a lot of political and uh, residential input um, there. Focus Toronto overall has 100 community partners. Um, uh, the uh, slide should actually read that we uh, have over 2,000 situations of elevated risk uh, since 2013. Sorry, I made the little thing wrong there. Um, uh, but uh, we are now producing over 10% of the uh, pr uh, province's data on situation tables. We're expanding to uh, open another table at uh, Jane and Finch, or what we're going to call the Black Creek. Um, a situation table with a November launch date. And our, our top risk factors include criminal behavior, mental health, homelessness, and housing. But in 2018, uh, uh, service refusal was replaced by drugs. Um, and this is uh, uh, drugs uh, with the study flags of opioids as well as uh, uh, meth. And uh, sixth slide, please. Last slide. Uh, yes, so uh, with the new government, um, uh, we, so we had a new government elected in uh, 2018 um, and uh, they came out uh, pretty strong messaging in terms of uh, there were going to be cuts. Um, some ministries uh, are still innovating in the dark though. Uh, in the Ministry of Attorney General, we're uh, building justice centers, which are community justice centers based on an American model. Uh, they were going to launch three pilots, one in the downtown east of Toronto, one in London, Ontario, and one in Windsor, Ontario. Um, the new government, uh, uh, Premier Ford and his new government uh, decided to open a justice centre expanding the pilot into the northwest of Toronto. So we are now looking at uh, opening up two different uh, uh, justice centres where community and justice in the actual systems will be in the same room. Uh, and somebody will be um, able to receive services on site as they navigate the justice system. Um, this, of course, is tightly tied to the work of our unit and as well to the creation of the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan. And so with that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. So we're going to hand it off to Martin Thompson, and I think Alina is going to be uh, his presentation partner. So mm -hmm. now we'll hand it over to you now. Sure. Martin, are you on? Marty, are you there? You're muted. You're still muted, Marty. Yep. Are, can oh, you hear me is. now? Okay, yep. Thanks. You're good. Amazing. Welcome. <laughs> so the uh, the city of Lethbridge, like most communities, has a social policy policy where we envision uh, a city uh, with where individual families and communities have opportunities for so for healthy development and social well-being. And like most communities across Canada, we are experiencing a significant increase in social related issues such as homelessness, drug and substance abuse, domestic violence, crime, poverty, racism. It has become very clear uh, how we are addressing our social well-being issues is not working. And we've been challenged at all levels to find answers and explore better ways of addressing our safety and social well-being issues. In addition, our taxpayers are not an unlimited source of funding. We need to be innovative, resourceful, and collaborative uh, to leverage all available funding. Um, so yes, we have a social policy. Uh, we will never be a, a city free of social issues, but we need to radically change how we address these issues in Lethbridge. And to achieve this vision, uh, we need to evolve and we need a made for Lethbridge strategy grounded in evidence and one that leverages and integrates all available resources. And to, like any strategy, you need a solid needs assessment. We need to define the problem before we uh, create solutions. And so we have done exhaustive work in this area. And uh, next slide, please. And, you know, we've done robust data collection. We've done extensive stakeholder engagement. Um, but one unique piece uh, that we did uh, a lot of social asset mapping work. We mapped all social assets within the city of Lethbridge to help us identify all resources within the community, which it served also as a gap analysis. And using the Help Seeker program, 
To date, we have mapped over 1,400 programs and services uh, addressing social well-being and safety issues in Lethbridge. And for a community our size, 100,000 people, that is a lot. And which uh, we've also determined we have mass duplication and very siloed, fragmented programs. So from a very high level at the needs assessment, um, we, again, I can share the actual document, but it was a 124 page, very detailed social well-being uh, needs assessment. And, uh, you know, we are a growing and diverse community. Uh, we are at 100,000 people now. We are urbanizing where we serve a hub area of over 340,000 people, which includes, uh, you know, people coming to our community for, for social programs and so forth. We do have some unique uh, population uh, pieces that other communities don't. We have a very high population of seniors. Uh, we border the largest Indigenous reserve in Canada. So we have a very high number of Indigenous folks, high number of newcomers. But uh, from a provincial average, we have the highest number of people with uh, disabilities in Lethbridge also, uh, cognitive, mental, physical uh, uh, disabilities. And like most communities, there's in that increased demand for, you know, we've got poverty issues, housing affordability, homelessness issues. Our homelessness uh, went up from 2016 to 18 when we did our pit count, uh, went up about 150%. And of course, with that, significant health and safety challenges. Our domestic violence rate is three times the provincial average. Um, we have a, a, super, a, a supervised consumption site in Lethbridge that is the busiest in Canada and uh, we are being told the busiest in the world. We have over 700 visits per day at our supervised consumption sites. So all of this, of course, uh, to echo Chief McPhee, this puts huge demands on our social uh, service providers, our emergency responders and so forth. Um, Next slide, please. And, uh, you know, through our needs assessment, we identified our primary social issues and key demographic groups. And, you know, uh, not a whole lot different from other communities, um, but we do have some unique features again, that we have a, a large and growing population of seniors who are in need. We have a higher than provincial average, again, of people with disabilities of all types. We have a very high domestic violence rate. And again, a large indigenous population inflicted by social issues and, and, and by the uh, opioid crisis we are experiencing. Next slide, please. So as we, uh, took, we took the needs assessment and then ultimately we created our strategy on how to address that which is our community well-being and safety strategy. And it's grounded in four foundational concepts. And uh, the first being individual well-being, and that uh, is the end goal. Every individual is different, and if we are truly gonna help them, we need to address their specific issues and needs. If not, they will continue to cycle through the system. And you know, the 700 visits a day at the consumption site is just a, a key example of a prime outcome where those folks aren't achieving that individual well-being, and that number is growing every day. We need to get better. As identified through our social asset mapping work, again, we have over 1,400 programs and services uh, in Lethbridge, but without purposeful consolidation and integration of those services, then often individual well-being is not achieved. It's very fragmented, it's very siloed. Uh, and uh, we need to, in Lethbridge to spend more time on that integration and consolidation piece to allow us to focus our effort and dollars on the individual, not on the various levels of bureaucracy, organizations, programs, and, and committees. So the fundamental concept that really is a priority for us is that systems planning and integration. Uh, we require that disciplined approach uh, and to promote that individual well-being. And the needs assessment clearly showed a lack of system integration within Lethbridge and within our community. 
And, and that was not only the data that was constantly heard in a frustration by uh, our key stakeholders. And ultimately, if uh, that's going to generate that collective impact, uh, we've all talked about, we need that disciplined cross-sector approach to achieve collective impact. And the city of Lethbridge is, has to play that, uh, in that collective impact, must play, provide that backbone support. We heard loud and clear from the community that the city of Lethbridge needs to take a leadership role to promote systems integration to generate collective impact. This is our community and we can't expect the government of Alberta or Canada to do this. And we can't wash our hands and expect the community uh, to do the work on their own. So as a city of Lethbridge, we, we've stepped up and said we need to be that backbone, that facilitator, convener and coordinator of this movement. Uh, to get the, everybody rowing in the rowboat together. And the final piece, uh, the concept community governance. Um, currently we have a maze of committees with layers of administrative bureaucracy. We need to work smarter, not harder. And, and the volume of individual committees, each with their own strategy, systems and processes, create natural barriers and limitation and stifle that collective impact. If we're going to achieve it, that collective impact, we need to revise the current structure and move toward an integrated community governance model and allow us to consolidate and coordinate strategy implementation, outcome measurement, funding, uh, data collection and reporting. Uh, next slide, please. So this really is it's just a drill down again on the importance of the if the well-being uh, we don't want those individuals to continue to cycle through the system and uh, and the, you know the outcome of all of this work is not necessarily spending more do dollars but it's using our system better to achieve that uh, well-being an integrated safety net ecosystem will need to work across all of these domains to achieve desired impact and overcome that siloed approach. Next slide, please. So, you know, we have not only mapped the resources within our, within the city of Lethbridge, but we have mapped all of the social assets within the community. And again, we're not a huge community. We're a population of 100,000 people. And so we have roughly, you know, $9 million within this that the city controls that we can uh, delegate or a lot to social issues. But the true dollars in, is in the community. Through uh, Help Seeker, we map the total charitable revenues that come to the city of Lethbridge, and it's over 700 million. And that's not anecdotal data, that's right from Canada and revenue agencies. And we've drilled down to determine out of that 700 million, we can leverage, uh, directly leverage 108 million or about 14% uh, directly for addressing social issues. And so again, we've got 1,400 primary social services in Lethbridge, and we know there are many more if you include the secondary, more informal groups such as neighborhood associations and church groups. Of the 700 million, uh, if we can take that 108 million and leverage it and consolidate it and apply systems planning and integration, we will uh, have collective impact. So unlike other communities, uh, you know, I'm hearing in the, the webinar, Toronto and that, we're moving in this direction, but we've got a ways to go. But our initial focus uh, in our community well-being and safety strategy is that systems planning and integration. So right now we're working on collaborating with all of our stakeholders to consolidate and coordinate uh, our social well-being and safety funding portfolios across the entire community to, and then implement citywide strategy, citywide social outcome measurement and reporting processes and developing and implementing that community governance model, uh, which we're uh, just completing the, uh, the terms of reference on that, and we're calling it our community well-being and integration table. So we, we still have a long way to go, 
um, but I am very excited about the direction we're going and I'll turn it over to Alina now. Awesome, thanks. And uh, next slide, please. So when we looked at the Lethbridge approach and were challenged to uh, actually figure out a way to implement it in practice at that user level, um, we had to um, obviously contend with different tables and different complex um, client working groups that are already existing in the community. We also had to manage the expectations from various funders, such as reaching home around coordinated access, but also the other uh, funders that were um, investing in the Lethbridge community. And as Marty said, it's much bigger than any one system. So how do you think about integrated coordinated access across the entire social safety net with exactly what Dale was referencing before when you're looking at these cross-cutting issues and if you look at the person as an individual, you can bifurcate them and then send them to these different tables to deal with domestic violence over there. You need to deal with your uh, criminal charges over here. You need to deal with your homelessness over there because we don't have the resources and the manpower and we're not gonna get the collective impact we desire, and we're not gonna achieve that individual well-being outcome that we're seeking that's really holistic and, and requires us to work in an integrated fashion. So when we looked at that and said, okay, let's apply this lens to um, coordinated access and how we're going to structure access to the system across the entire community. So not just the four programs that are being funded through Reaching Home, I think it's actually less than that in, in Lethbridge, not just the 9 million that the city directly funds, but the actual 1400 that Marty referenced. How do you actually connect them all to work as a system, to work in an integrated fashion? So I'm, I'm putting up here the, the usual steps that, uh, that we might be familiar with in, on the homeless uh, serving system side about you know, information screening, program matching, doing your intake and assessment, and, um, and then going into your service, uh, service plan. And it's usually very much focused on, on housing. And as you can see here, it's actually applied, the concept is applied to anybody looking for help, right? So it might be the, uh, the parent that doesn't know how to deal with and with the, the youth running away from home. Uh, it might be the, um, the child that is not showing up to school or showing up to school hungry all the time. And it might be the chronically homeless individual in the shelter as well. But how do we actually apply a prevention lens, a holistic lens, and integrate all of the various resources we have in the community to intervene at the right time with the right approach? So uh, we'll tell you about how uh, we're beginning this work in, in Lethbridge. Uh, next slide, please. So um, again, using the language of, of reaching home just to, to make the connection for those of you um, rolling out coordinated access. So you're familiar with the idea of a by names list. So a, essentially a list of folks that need um, housing interventions. And in Lethbridge, when we did our analysis of, of who's actually represented in that homeless population, we have about 2,000 people that will go in and out of homelessness during the course of the year. Now, obviously not every one of them is uh, going to be chronically homeless, majority will not be, but it's indicative of, of housing instability and let's say shelter use uh, maybe once or twice or or episodically, but definitely not that core population. And then we have about 20,000 that we've identified to be vulnerable to, um, to homelessness because of extreme core housing need in the community. So that's the kind of traditional way that we look at um, building a by names list. But as I said before, the mandate of the social well-being and safety strategy is not just these um, housing unstable people. It's actually a much broader uh, segment group because we need to take into account things like addictions risk, for instance, or people that have a substance um, use challenge or people that might be at risk for that because we're looking at things holistically as well. And as you know, there's lots of risk factors involving um, or related to, to um, homelessness as well that are very much overlapping. So if we're looking at this and saying, okay, we're gonna look beyond just the homeless population, we're gonna look at vulnerability uh, and well-being more holistically than um, 
then that also means that we need to look at our systems map differently as well. Because traditionally we would just focus on, on the homeless population and then we would look at our homelessness programs and then we just we would play a matching game in a way. Um, and so the traditional way of, of doing your inventory of program spaces would have been to, to look at your reaching home funds. So in Lethbridge, about $500,000, um, or let's say the 9 million from the city, but now that we have done our systems map and we know there's actually $700 million out there that creates the scope is that much larger for us. So it's not just a, creating a process of matching people from, um, you know, a couple of hundred people on a, on a list to three programs. It's actually how do you transform the entire social safety net to work in the right direction? And it's obviously seemingly an overwhelming task. So you need to, of course, eat the elephant one bite at a time. So we're going to talk to you next about how we've commenced this process because it's not all at once. We're phasing it in uh, one stage at a time, but this is the vision, right? And you have to set it up this way because otherwise you're going to create false expectations of that community. You're not going to have the right framework going in and you're not going to engage the right players because if you're, if you're too, fo too narrowly focused, you might miss the bigger picture in the work. Now, I'm not telling you to do it all at once. I'm saying have the bigger picture in mind as you start tackling um, bits that are manageable um, as you roll this out. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, this is just a, a snapshot of the occupancy dashboard. So when we talk about um, the systems map and we say, we're matching people that come up on the by names list to spaces in the system. You can see here, we're not just looking at um, housing programs. So you, there you have a, a number of, um, of occupancy in, in those programs and, and what might be available, but we're also looking at, at programs that are happening across um, the system of care that you can connect the clients to. So how the housing system isn't left holding the bag for all of the person's issues and vice versa. If there is a housing intervention that's needed, you're able to leverage everything in the system um, to connect people at the right time with those resources as well. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so a couple of points about the integrated coordinate access model that is being rolled out in, in Lethbridge right now. So um, we're creating a kind of a phased approach and I'll walk you through the end user journey a little bit. But um, what we've determined is that a lot of the folks that are out in the community and might be experiencing some level of vulnerability um, at that primary prevention level. So we, they might they might be looking for information or um, they might have some experience of risk, but they're not vulnerable yet, right? They're just in that, that broader population pool. And in those contexts, it's you don't need to intervene with this hardcore social worker um, hack team or uh, intensive case management. In some of those cases, people can resolve their challenges on their own or they can access information that they need and, and, and move on. So for instance, I'm going through a divorce and I need to um, get access to some mental health and counseling supports. Well, that could be you know me, let's say. <laughs> um, if I work too late and my husband gets too, uh, too set up with me, but usually, those folks are not going to be um, the chronically homeless or the, the high system users that, that you tend to deal with and um, at the situations tables that, that Dale uh, was referencing before. So for that context, we're leveraging technology, right? So we're using the Help Seeker app to connect people to those resources up front because it's, again, we don't need a social worker middleman to facilitate information referral in the day and age of, of Uber and Netflix, et cetera. Uh, now, of course, there's gonna be, there's always gonna be phone calls and in-person things. So we need to have a process for when people do uh, come, up, come up and self-identify needing some of that info and referral, we need to have a consistent process for what happens. But in, again, all of that is, is uh, using this, the same tool, um, the online system map through Help Seeker, because then again, the entire community, all of the different 1400 programs out there are uh, using the same playbook to make the same referrals. So in Help Seeker, for instance, the CMHA uh, reception desk, when somebody calls or somebody comes in and they all they need is a referral, they'll go online and show them the app and show them how to use the app, and then hopefully next time they can do it themselves. So you don't even need that, that intervention. Now, let's say 
that's that's not cutting it and there's there's more going on um, with the person the next level to determine the person's match with programs is a well-being screener so again the idea is you know we're not going to do this full assessment and this hardcore you know clinical uh, deep dive into your um, into your case if we don't need to but um, is there a way that we can quickly screen for diverse elements of of what's going on in in, in your life and determine a better a better fit now the cool thing about um, doing a screener is that it can be self directed as well so again do you need a middleman to answer 10 questions by yourself one to five how well are how well are you doing on your housing one being i'm you know i'm homeless to five i'm i'm happy and i'm um i'm good to go but if you go through that and there's about 15 different well-being elements that we've identified through the literature um and are able to kind of rate yourself and then say, okay, well, you scored really low on these. You might want to look at these following resources to, if you're interested in, in doing something about that, right? So if you score yourself really low on housing and uh, you put yourself as a one, like a chronically homeless um, individual, for instance, then here's the resources that you should be looking at as a next step. So again, that's something that can be done at any of the program entry points into the system, and it can also be done online because people should be able to um, to self-screen and self-assess and, and be able to navigate the system more easily. So that's the, the piece that we have a prototype that are and are starting to test in the community um, with funded agencies first. For a low B, um, for a low being score, so somebody that self rates really, really low, um, which means that there's something going on. Um, if they rate themselves low on um, housing and homelessness, or um, things to do with their safety or or health and well and that actual kind of clinical health related issue, um, they get a referral or a suggested referral through the online app or in person if they're doing the, the screener in person. And, and at that point, if they, they would be um, uh, going through an acuity assessment with an actual um, staff, like clinical staff or trained staff, trained in assessment. And the trick here on, on this, and you might be wondering how we're, how we're dealing with this, is every system out there has their own um, evidence-led and, and a very good reason for acuity assessment tools. So acuity assessment is obviously much different than, than a well-being screener because it's they're usually much more in depth there. There's a clinical reason why you're asking some of these questions. So uh, rather than us dictating acuity across 1,400 programs that do everything from early childhood uh, intervention to uh, permanent supportive housing, we said, Okay, there's a rationale for why the homeless serving system is using this badad or the bad, or um, there's a rationale why Alberta Health Services is using the locus for their mental health and addiction clinical teams, and there's a reason why the domestic violence services are using um, domestic violence risk assessments. So what we said is all of those systems report what they use so that we have a kind of we are able to track that across the system and understand how various components are, are rating clients and, and determining eligibility, but we're not going to dictate to health how they should do clinical assessments. They, we're going to let them do what they do, but we're going to have a coordinated way to understand it and are able to communicate that across systems. So, um, so this level of acuity assessment happens at that um, at that system level, once the person has been screened that, you know, they really need to be looking at their health um, or their housing or their um, uh, violent situation and um, that happens as at integrated access sites so it doesn't happen at every single one of these 1400 programs right it happens at these door agencies that have been designated as part of integrated coordinated access um, once the acuity assessment happens the client might begin to work on um, on receive services from uh, the appropriate program. However, um, we do have a plan for the ones that score extremely high further. So um, if something, if somebody is determined to be um, highly vulnerable and, and high risk, for instance, they would actually go to uh, an integrated service planning table and from there would receive uh, cross-system interventions 
to um, to dig it even deeper into those challenges. And this is where our, our high system users come in. And I think this is where uh, our, you know, we call it integrated service planning tables, hub model, um, CA table, whatever you want to call it, that's, that's what it is. Um, and then all of this, obviously, we need to keep track of. So integrated information management is our big challenge to overcome right now because we have ETO that's being used in the, on the housing side and uh, obviously police has their own system, health has their own system, these other 1400 some programs are all reporting all over the place. So our big um, you know, to do is to figure out our, how we're gonna track individuals across the system and how we're gonna share information. Now, now luckily we have protocols in place for integrated service planning because we've you know we've um, done some of this work in through Hughes in Edmonton and Calgary Case Management Group in, in Calgary. So we're able to leverage a precedence to uh, use those tools and adapt them fairly quickly so that we actually have um, our first the singles table already operating. And that's a collaboration between Alberta Health Services, the city, Arches, um, Lethbridge Police Service. Um, and there's obviously collaboration with Blood Tribe that's not in Lethbridge, but is obviously very much related uh, from what you heard from Marty. Um, the Health Canada asked, that's a plug because we wanted to get some additional clinical resources to um, support some of our uh, high system users and uh, especially around meth. Um, but we'll see how, how that goes. So we might report back um, how we took this to the next level, but right now we're using what we have um, and working smarter, not harder, as Marty said. Next slide, please. Now, promise to go quicker. <laughs> um, I also said I wanted to give you an overview of how these uh, integrated service planning uh, tables work and, um, and you know, we just, this, all, everything that Marty said, by the way, has happened in the last six months. So we are running, um, we're building the plane as we fly, but we heard so loud and clear from the community, stop talking, get going, show us the results, show us impact. People are literally dying on our streets. So um, our first table that we, um, well, we had our first meeting last week and this week, the, um, the service deliveries has commenced on the top system users. The way that we've uh, mobilized that is, again, screening in for integrated service planning at uh, key entry points, and those entry points are uh, EMS, police, ER, supervised consumption site, uh, shelter, and DOT is our outreach team in Lethbridge. And then they're prioritized uh, for service. You can see there the target population is complex comorbidity and trimorbidity, very complex um, individuals with mental health addictions, history of trauma, um, tons of justice interactions, et cetera. And of course, your, your usual um, high system use across the board from uh, for anything from remand and Alberta corrections to um, EMS, ER, uh, hospitalizations, et cetera. And then they're, um, once they're prioritized for service, and indeed we say, yeah, you know what, looking at all of these assessment tools and, and their history of public system use, so all these systems share information on how many times they've seen this individual, then, um, and we say, yeah, this, is, this one makes sense for us. They're a top system user, let's go. They're assigned a lead support worker. And then an integrated service plan delivery commences. So AHS's role is providing clinical supports. That's what they do best. They're, it's expensive work, so we, ha we have to use that, that resource judiciously. Um, we have city programs, so using reaching home and provincial housing dollars and uh, CSS prevention dollars as well, we can do things that AHS can't do. So we can do the wraparound supports, the navigation uh, um, of those 1,400 different programs to connect people to things that they need, anything from a food bank to a rent subsidy to a, a housing unit, et cetera. We, we can do that through the city programs. Police's role is that backup, so where clinical and housing support can go in safely, that we have the, the police backup. Police also sees these guys all the time. Um, guys and, and girls, I should say. And then again, um, about 840 programs we see as, as having put particular um, relevance to this high system user population. And our whole goal is, you know, uh, 
you're stabilizing up front, obviously, and you're doing the housing and, and treatment access, et cetera, up front, but you're also wanting to look beyond that at sustainability because once you house folks, they do stabilize after a while and then they start getting lonely and then they start coming back to the supervised consumption side because that's where all the activities are. So, you know, how do we hook them up to a healthy, um, fun and inclusive things to do so that they get back into um, or, or into a healthy lifestyle as much as possible. So what kind of recreation opportunities are out there for them? How can we tap into those? What are they doing on a day-to-day -to, -day to feel like they're contributing members of society? So how are they getting into the workforce or volunteering, et cetera? And that is not necessarily the job of the homeless serving system, but what we can do is make sure that they're connected into those services and, and follow up and, and keep tabs to make sure that that's happening. So that's the, the role that um, the city's funded programs are taking in this. And then of course, this outcomes and systems use monitoring because these guys are high system users. They're not gonna resolve their challenge in three months. Now, the next wave or the next sprint might look differently um, in terms of who, who we get in through this because we've housed we kind of go by top 100 and work our way down the list. Um, but, you know, the, the process has to constantly uh, ebb and flow and new partners might need to be uh, coming in as well. But until we get the, the top 100 um, off the list and, and stabilize, that's the focus for the next six months. So um, go ahead. Okay. And I said I would also show you just the user journey. This would be the this high complex um, client, let's say that they had to go through all of these different entry points and before they got into, into um, the system. Um, but at any point they could be diverted as well. So the access point where they, they self direct themselves using um, the help seeker app to get connected, well being screening where they get a, a quick intervention at that primary or secondary prevention level, the acuity assessment to determine uh, whether they need a more intensive in intervention all the way to the integrated service planning table where they've got, you know, major risk happening where we need a, a systems level uh, integrated response to um, to deal with the challenges ahead. Um, and then of course the kind of flow through the program and um, and to, or at least into the right program or programs. Next. Oh, good questions. <laughs> Perfect. There we go. I'll uh, leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you so much to all the panelists. We're going to just shift right into the question and answer period because there are a few questions that have uh, already trickled in. So we're going to start with uh, Pat uh, F. And Pat is from Housing and Homelessness System in the Waterloo region. The question is for the Edmonton presenter. Can you tell us a bit more about what dedicated housing is related to the Edmonton Police Services? So I, I would imagine maybe this is for uh, Chief Dale McPhee. I'm not sure if he's still on the line. Dale, are you still with us? I am. It's, <clears throat> I'm thinking that is probably meant or targeting Susan though, but maybe oh. between the two of us, we could answer it. Sure. Um, I can tell you what we operate and fund within the space of permanent supportive housing. We have a variety of units that and, and projects um, that have different models on site. And in many cases, Homer Trust owns the property and is the developer. And then we fund organizations that have focused programs um, on populations that we serve. Those include Bissell, um, Spady, Mustard Seed, there's a number of different organizations and they range in terms of uh, their models. They are um, as specific as with this, a, a project focused on permanent, su permanent supportive housing for FAS uh, individuals, and these are single adults. And we also have a project like NOVA, which is focused on youth. It is not a permanent supportive housing, but it is also beyond the typical model of transitional for youth in that it brings into its model some harm reduction approaches that we don't often see in youth projects. So um, there's um, a range, and I think probably what the question is about is how does it con how do those units specifically connect to our, our coordinated access system, which I would just add that 
um, for for us to be engaging with that, those organizations that call themselves permanent supportive housing in our community, because we, we, we really do need to think carefully about what it is and what it isn't. It's not just any project uh, that happens to have a little program enhancement. So these are programs that actually are actively engaged with our coordinated access and referral system and housed from that list and housed from those individuals that have been prioritized at a system level. I hope that helps. Excellent. And sorry, Dale, did you have anything to add to that? No, I, I you know, that, as I said, that's Susan's uh, area of expertise. I mean, for us, it's more about uh, how can we play a role helping with that to make sure it's con uh, consistent and connected on a continuum of services. Because I think looking at anything in isolation uh, has been part of our problem, not necessarily in Edmonton, but across uh, the country is what is the part of this plays in a continuum? And if we look at these in a continuum space, do we have all the aspects uh, covered? So housing first obviously is one area, but then there's <clears throat> that environment almost pre-housing first, which is something that we deal with at Edmonton on a police service every day uh, with the city as well. How can we better, uh, uh, how can we do a better job on this, uh, you know, and then eventually obviously get people uh, and we can even say one at a time into that um, support of housing or housing first strategy. And that's obviously depending on mental health addictions amongst other things. So uh, I think uh, I think from what I got of that question, I think Susan kind of uh, uh, nailed that exactly what's done. Excellent, thank you so much to both of you. So our next question is for all of the presenters and it comes from Lydia R, a family support worker at TWH. So it starts with a general comment, um, and the comment is that in all of this um, has been a comprehensive set of information concerning the community system integrating for a more comprehensive system of care. However, what seems to be the biggest resistance to implementing integrated care um, is systems collaborating and communicating better with police, clinicians, about service workers. So. Um, or and service workers, sorry. So how can we reduce the barriers for this change? And um, Lydia mentioned that one speaker alluded that the process has begun, but that we have a long way to go still. So any insights about that? Dale, do you want to take that? Or sure. yeah, I'll, go for it. I'll take a, I'll take a stab sure. at that. So um, I, that's what I was referring to. I, I think the police need to probably play a role in leading this change in the community because it is a 24-7, 365 uh, response system. I think we can also take a role in making sure privacy is protected. But at the end of the day, when we're talking safety in individuals' lives, we got to stop uh, not being able to have the, the hard conversation to get people help. And quite frankly, a large part of this is way free the justice system. I think actually it's 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 a unique problem if you think about it in a context, uh, you know, from a government perspective, as you or you mentioned, or a different thing is if you take mental health and addictions, which obviously housing plays a big role of it. If you looked at it in the government context, uh, you know, it's five to seven percent of every budget uh, health budget, but it's probably sixty percent greater of. Uh, uh, of the services provided in social services, justice, education, advanced education, and employment. And as a result, we create redundant systems. And I think the police can actually play a role uh, in driving that back together. And I think that's actually part of the reason why well, it is that I came back from a deputy minister role to here. I think the community needs to lead this change. Uh, I think programs such as ho uh, housing that we have at Edmonton through Susan and Homer Trust or a great start of that, but I think there's a whole data piece that if we're going to get uh, successful, that we have to have it integrated and we can't be afraid to share information. I mean, mm -hmm. I think uh, in several of my roles, I think I've talked to every privacy commissioner in the country at some point over the years and, you know, privacy was built to share information, not to not share information. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. thing that I'd last, last end on that is collaboration without authority uh, quite simply doesn't work. We're looking for partnerships. I always equate this type to a little humor is, uh, is my morning breakfast, bacon and eggs. Uh, the chicken was the collaborator. He was involved. Uh, the pig was the partner. <laughs> Sorry. He, 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 was, he, he was committed and uh, she was committed. And the long story short, that's what this is, is partnerships where we uh, set the goals and mutual together and we start moving forward. And that won't be 
led by government that needs to be led locally. Yeah, I would say too, just from um, having done these in different communities, is it's it's the will and it's the leadership and it's the it's kind of the early adapter champions, you know, that ha that are in the right positions that need to be driving this. So, you know, you think of somebody like Dale or Susan, and they're in positions where they can influence systems and they can bring other system players together. And it's exactly that that attitude that privacy is not meant to be a barrier. Uh, for an individual's well-being, they're meant to be an enabler for that. And we have so many great examples of of tools to get over this information sharing red herring. And I think we're more than willing to to share everything that that we're doing in these various communities because you know we borrow big borrow steel and and adapt as well. So even things like terms of reference or uh, information sharing protocols to be able to do integrated service planning, all of that stuff is. Look at it as freeware and look at these examples and point your leaders to these examples to say, hey, if you've got a question about it, reach out to other decision makers to see how they've overcome it and what the benefits are. So how are you resolving a pain point for, uh, for key decision makers through this type of approach? Otherwise, we're just going to be spinning our wheels in, in this uh, privacy issue and not do anything about it, about the people that are actually needing support. Great. And any thoughts from the other panelists before we move on? Okay. So just being cognizant of time, I just want to give the presenters um, a, a quick, uh, some quick time to just uh, give any of their final thoughts. Um, there are a few more questions from the audience. Uh, Alina, lots of questions about Help Seeker. Dan, there was a question for you specifically about the SPIDER program. Um, just in the interest of time, what I'll do is make sure that presenters get those questions, audience, so not to worry, they will see them, and we'll figure out a mechanism to perhaps get those answers back to you. Um, but panelists, are there any final thoughts that you have about your presentation, any takeaways that you'd like the audience to leave today with? Uh, this is Susan. I, I think um, what I, from when I was first invited to participate in this, I thought it was interesting because I thought, wow, what a, a range of presenters and content and perspectives. And I, I think it's uh, great that there was thematically and really a unifying message around the importance of this kind of collaboration coordination. But I also um, really value and I want to make sure we don't collectively lose the fact that a lot of what we were talking about was not in that theoretical um, kind of academic space that often system integration work ends up in that, you know, trying to turn a titanic, titanic in an inch of water type work that we grind away at, but that there's an action orientation. And I think that was really mm -hmm. stressed in the, in the work that Elena's doing with, with Lethbridge as well. And I think that, you know, that's where we have wins. I've been in too many groups and too many, you know, really well-intended rooms where, um, the diffusion of energy and focus and, and ultimately commitment happens pretty quickly if there isn't results and the results need to like like literally within six months if we're not mm -hmm. making yeah. a difference we, yeah. we lose all that leadership so I think that balance of those things uh, we can benefit from the theory and there there is like in all things there's there's really great ways to bake a cake and there's really great ways to do system planning. And you know, there are best practices. Um, there's uh, emerging practices probably is, is, is a better way to frame it, but I think that action orientation balance with what, what has thematically been the importance of, you know, a lot of tables and getting people in the room, but just keeping that in the forefront, because otherwise we just end up with what I, I have on my desk and I have in a lot of my presentations is that diminishing return on collaboration. You know, we can just be in all the rooms all the time talking mm -hmm. about the same thing and don't get that important feedback loop of action. Tim, can I just add to that? It's uh, Dale here. <clears throat> so Absolutely. I Go for it. I would uh, add a couple things just to expand on Susan. I think first and foremost, it's important that we get the question right. And uh, then secondly, that, you know, strategy definitely has implementation. And a couple examples of that that I'll give you that are real. Um, when we chase money or we chase something, sometimes we don't have the question right. And I'll give you some examples of this. We've got a fentanyl crisis in Canada right now, particularly more so in the West, but it's right across Canada. You know, in a fentanyl overdose, you know, it's an opioid person uses it. It's very tragic. It's tragic the individual, it's tragic in the family. And some would argue that the, the impact on the community may not be as great, the greater community. 
And then over on the other side, you've got marijuana. You know, some still say legalization, not legalization. I think that ship has sailed. But the impaired driving uh, uh, is is a concern still. But other than that, cheesy sales are going to go up. In the middle, we've got meth. Uh, it's disproportionately tearing communities apart. What we got to be careful is we don't just chase the drug. There's a pathway. There's a person that goes through this. And a lot of these people that are involved in this pathway use fentanyl, they use meth, they use marijuana, and they'll use every other drug that come out. And we haven't really looked at it from a pathway. We've looked at it from a drug uh, perspective. And I think we got to make sure that when we build out this strategy that we're looking at this more encompassing about the individuals and the pathways. If you look at communities, and I've been involved in many, we have a housing strategy, homeless strategy, we have a mental health strategy, we have an addiction strategy, we have an FASD strategy, we have a bail remand strategy, we have a strategy strategy. And you know what? If, from what I've seen, it's mostly the same people in every strategy. And we haven't looked at it from whether <laughs> exactly. it's or marginalized, and we haven't looked at pathways. And we have a lot of bright people on the line, uh, and I don't mean just the presenters because I don't consider myself in that area, but there's a lot of people that are studying this space. We need to put the people at the center of this, and it's not going to be a cookie-cutter approach. And, and I think it's just important because I think that has driven us into further isolation and further things that maybe we haven't maximized on the value and impact of our resources and our money. So I would just, I'd just throw that out there. Okay. Anyone else uh, on the panel that would like to share their final thoughts? Um, no, just it's interesting that you came at these conclusions, Dale, from you know coming as a from the police and and we're coming at this from health and and social services and and it's we're all and you know we're all meeting on the same page. So I think that call to action is there. We we do have the theory and now we have to. We're putting it into practice and we need to keep this conversation going because it's an emerging field and the more work we do around homelessness the more i would challenge all of us to think about it from that broader well-being and safety perspective because homelessness is just one aspect of this and, and we're never going to end homelessness if we don't um, tackle these additional components um, upstream so thank you Great. Well, thank you so much to all of our presenters here with us today. We had Alina Turner, Principal of Turner Strategies, CEO and co-founder of Help Seeker. We had Dale McPhee, Chief of Police with the Edmonton Police Service. We had Susan McGee, CEO of Homeward Trust Edmonton, Dan Bro, Manager of Community Safety and Wellbeing with the City of Toronto, and Martin Thompson, Manager of Community and Social Development with the City of Lethbridge. Thank you so much for sharing all of your insights. And thanks to the audience for joining us here today. The webinar was recorded. You will receive an email with the webinar recording as well as a copy of the presentation slides. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll, we'll try our best to get your questions, any questions that were not answered to the presenters so that they, they know what kind of information you're interested in hearing more about. So thank you so much to everyone and have a wonderful day.